And the response by Israelis is indifference at best or wholesale support in its in most common form. We see this because even though there are demonstrations now against the Netanyahu government, it's important to keep in mind that these are demonstrations against him. These are not demonstrations against what Israel's doing in the Gaza Strip. To the contrary, 88% of Israelis are not satisfied that Israel has, believe that Israel hasn't used enough force against this occupied, dispossessed, civilian, refugee, child population. Our last speaker, Diana Butu, uh, is a Palestinian lawyer and analyst based in Haifa. She previously worked as a legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team and later to President Abbas. Diana was one of the lawyers who challenged the legality of Israel's apartheid wall before the International Court of Justice. She's a frequent commentator and writer on Palestine with articles appearing in the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, The Guardian, Foreign Policy, as well as in other major US papers. She holds degrees from the University of Toronto, Queen's University, Kellogg Northwestern, and Stanford Law School. She has held fellowships at Stanford and Harvard Law and Kennedy Schools. Diana has been a crucial voice over recent months, writing and providing interviews to the media, contextualizing what is happening in Gaza, and pushing back against the dehumanization of people in the Gaza Strip. We are very pleased to welcome Diana, and we'd love to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, I uh, wish I could be there in person, uh, but uh, alas, I cannot. And I want to thank everybody for attending, and particularly those who have organized this. Um, most particularly, I want to thank my two co-panelists, Daniel Levy, longtime friend, and Francesca, who is not just a friend, but um, somebody I admire very deeply and look up to, who um, has spent her, the past years of her mandate being so vocal uh, and so instrumental in making sure that that the issue of Palestine is is recognized, addressed, and serving as a voice at times when others of us cannot speak. So, thank you, Francesca, for for everything, and um, uh, and thank you all for for being here. Um, I too want to begin by looking back uh, to the day in which the the first day of the. The case, uh, South Africa's submission before the uh, before the ICJ, and the reason that I'm thinking back uh, to that particular day is because, on that day, it had marked three months since Israel's attack on the Gaza Strip. Three months since the genocide began, and it was so um, it was so difficult to hear the South African submission at the time. Not difficult because it wasn't true, it was entirely true, but it was difficult because we had spent the past three months before that thinking that it was just going to be a question of one video uh, being seen, one picture being seen, one interview, one article, one something was going to change world opinion and going to change the opinion of the powers that be to stop the genocide. And throughout that three month period, we hadn't had a chance to step back, to collect ourselves, to recognize and see in its entirety what Israel had done to us. That particular day, as I heard the submission, it was the first time that it really hit me just how much Israel had done over the course of those past three months. And today, once again, hearing Francesca, here we are at the six month mark, um, as she was as she was reading her her uh, giving her presentation, I once again wept because it was the first time in six months that we that I was able to step back and hear in its entirety everything that has happened to us. 
I say this because as Palestinians, we've spent our entire existence not being seen, not being heard, or rather being ignored. This is an area that is perhaps the most documented in history, from major human rights organizations to the UN, to you name it, to, to world media. And yet, despite this over-documentation of what has happened to Palestinians, there seems to be a collective denial that it hasn't actually happened to us, or a collective acceptance that it's okay for it, for it to happen to us. It's okay for Israel to carry out a genocide. And so hearing uh, Francesca's words today really brings home, and reading the report, and I encourage every one of you to read the reports, 25 pages, and every page, every line is packed with, with so much information um, that it's, it's, it, it will stand out as being a gem in history. Nobody can say that they didn't know after reading this report. Nobody could say they didn't know before it either, but particularly after reading this report. I say this because I want to pivot a little bit to where it is that I live and how it is that we are now as Palestinians living. I live in historic Palestine. I live in a city called Haifa. Um, and I spend a lot of my time between Haifa and between Ramallah, which is in the West Bank. And going between, I used to live in Gaza many, many years ago. I've not been allowed into Gaza since um, 2006, but um, that's a different story. I have many friends there still. Living in this space during this period and even before has always meant that you are effectively a ghost, that you don't matter, that your rights don't matter, that what Israel does to you doesn't matter, and that it can simply be waved away as and dismissed as somehow a consequence and somehow irrelevant. And today in particular, living in Haifa, you can see so much of the genocidal um, intent, the genocidal speech that Francesca was talking about and that the ICJ uh, was referring to. You can see so much of it. In fact, you live it every day. Every place I go, I see sign after sign that says things like, finish them. Um, and by the way, that's written in English, taking a, a cue from Nikki Haley's finish them um, speech. Or another one that says, end Gaza or even another one that says, together we will win. Now, when you probe people and ask them, what does together we will win mean? What does together mean? What does win mean? The response by Israelis is the erasure of Gaza. That's it. When you push back and say, do you really support the killing of 33 perhaps even for as high as 40,000 Palestinians, the killing of 14,000 children, the wholesale destruction of the largest Palestinian city, Gaza City. So much damage has been inflicted on the Gaza Strip, this small little piece of land, so much so that the World Bank is now estimating that it's in the tune of $18.5 billion, or 97%, of the, of the combined GDP of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That's how much damage has been done. And the response by Israelis is indifference at best or wholesale support in its in most common form. We see this because even though there are demonstrations now against the Netanyahu government, it's important to keep in mind that these are demonstrations against him these are not demonstrations against what Israel's doing in the Gaza Strip. To the contrary, 88% of Israelis are not satisfied that Israel has, believe that Israel hasn't used enough force against this occupied, dispossessed, civilian, refugee, child population. So we are facing not only these genocidal statements, but genocidal intent that has completely been ignored 
or in fact embraced, in the worst case ignored, in the, sorry, in the best case ignored, in the worst case embraced by Israeli society. Those same TikToks that you and I are seeing, TikToks of Israeli soldiers holding on to women's lingerie, TikToks of Israeli soldiers putting, writing proposals in the houses of, of, of uh, Palestinian houses inside the Gaza Strip. TikToks in which they are literally shackling people's hands to the point where their hands are requiring amputation. TikToks in which they are mocking Palestinians who, are, who have been thrown in prison, hostages. TikToks in which they are urinating on Palestinians. These are, this is the stuff, this is the same stuff that, you, the same, same thing that you're seeing is the same stuff that I'm seeing. And so you have to ask yourself, why? Why? Why is it that these TikToks are allowed to happen? Why is it that Israel is allowed to behave in this way? Why? And the answer is because for 76 years, Israel and Israelis have been coddled. They haven't been held accountable at all for any of the violations of human rights, for any of the war crimes that they have perpetrated, for any of the massacres that they have carried out, and certainly not for this genocide. In fact, to the contrary, we've already seen that one provisional uh, order, one order came out with provisional measures by the ICJ. A second one came out from the ICJ. The UN Security Council has voted for a ceasefire. And let me be clear in saying that there's no such thing as a non-binding Security Council resolution. They can try to rewrite history, but you can't rewrite it, but it's, it will fail. Despite all of that, despite these measures coming, but despite these orders and despite the ceasefire, we see that Israel has ignored it. And what has the response been? Crickets, silence. Because once again, the world has made Palestinians feel as though our lives mean nothing. That it doesn't matter that this is the most documented place on earth. All it is is that it's ex excusable, it can be turned a blind eye, and that actually the system of law isn't really a system of law. It's a system of law for the entire world, except for Israel. And this is where it becomes so vital and so important for our efforts to now be focused on this issue of accountability and on this issue of sanctions so that Israelis are no longer allowed to feel that they can post videos in the videos that they've been posting and do the things that they have been doing and get away with it. Believe me, inside Israeli society, nobody's even questioning this. Nobody's even saying, whoa, this is bad. To the contrary, it's being applauded. Now, I think also moving on from the issue of accountability, it's very important for us to also focus not simply on the issue of humanitarian. Palestine is not just a humanitarian issue. Indeed, Israel has turned it into a humanitarian crisis of proportions we have never seen. But this at its core is not a humanitarian issue. It is a political issue. And because it is a political issue, it is time for that political issue to be addressed. You may ask the question, how? And the answer is simple. Israel cannot continue to get away with treating Palestinians as though somehow they are inferior human beings. We cannot continue to have a system in which Jewish supremacy and superiority reigns. That is no longer the time for this. Instead, now is the time for us to be redoubling our efforts and to be pushing to hold Israel accountable and for that system of Jewish supremacy to finally come to an end. I want to end my, my remarks by um, talking a, a little bit about, again, this issue of politics and the attempts that are going to be taking shape in the next few months, perhaps years, to try to evade this issue of accountability and responsibility. We've already seen that there are attempts now 
to have a greater recognition of a Palestinian state. And we were, we're hearing that Spain has, is going to go down this path, of recognizing other countries will undoubtedly follow suit. We are already seeing that the UN, that at the UN, that there's going to, that they pushed it to a committee, this issue of, um, of a recognition of a Palestinian state and full Palestinian statehood. It's important for us to keep in mind something when it comes to the question of Palestinian statehood. Is Palestinian statehood going to lead to accountability? And I fear that the answer is no. Is Palestinian statehood going to be yet another means of the world trying to evade its responsibility and evade its responsibilities towards Palestinians and evade its responsibilities towards the Convention on the Prevention of Genocide. And I fear that this is precisely what is going to be done. We now have to really focus on our efforts on this issue of accountability. We cannot live in a world any longer where where one state, and that is Israel, is considered to be above international law and above all. Because, and I repeat this, I say this time and again, this isn't just about Israel. This is about the global international system of law as we know it. We either are going to be pushing to have a system of international law that is applicable to all, or we have a system of chaos. In the end, the choice boils down to you and the work that you are going to be doing in these coming days, in these coming months. I really hope that we together will be pushing to hold Israel accountable, including through an arms embargo, including through sanctions, including through all of the measures that Daniel mentioned of reassessing the association agreement and so on and so on and so on. This is the time for it to be done. Not later, but it is now. I want to end my remarks um, by just one little thing um, by talking about the 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 Nakba. And it's important to talk about the Nakba. Because as Francesca has laid out both in her arguments and um and in the and in her paper, this issue of genocide um goes all the way back to 1948 and the way that Israel has tried to get rid of Palestinians and take over their land. I personally am the daughter of a man who survived the Nekbe. My father was nine years old in 1948. He remembers, he passed away uh, a couple of years ago, but up until the time that he passed away, he remembered very clearly what it was like for him as a child to experience and go through the Nekbe. The Nekbe was not just the forcible displacement of Palestinians, which is what we've kind of turned it into the euphemism of uh, today. It was actually the wholesale destruction of Palestinian society. Overnight, communities, Israel destroyed communities and sent them fleeing. Overnight, Israel destroyed schools. Overnight, they destroyed um, houses, cemeteries. Overnight, they killed. Overnight, my father was transformed into being Palestinian, living in his homeland, to being an unwanted minority in the state of Israel. And to this day, we still see the ghosts of the Nekbe. We still see them when we see the villages that Israel completely erased. We still see them when we see the remnants of the plants that are there, the sabr, uh, the uh, prickly pear, the cactus that remains. We still see it with all of the foliage. We cannot continue to pretend as though the Nakbe didn't happen. And we cannot pretend that what Israel's doing today is not a continuation of this Nekbe. I never believed 
that I would live to see with my own eyes on my own phone and hearing from my friends in Gaza the exact same things that my father experienced 76 years ago. It is very important for us to make the connection between what Zionism was about in 1948 and what Zionism is about today. It's about erasure.